So this is part two of the recording for chapter 12 review. We left off um, on B6, which is also called pyridoxine. And it is also involved in many metabolic reactions, just like all of the B vitamins as coenzymes. Um, especially in protein amino acid reactions. It also um, synthesizes the neurotransmitters that are so important as a part of our nervous system. And it converts tryptophan to niacin. So I had mentioned with niacin that we can get niacin from the protein amino acid tryptophan. One of the big functions of B6 is to break down stored glycogen, which is really important because we use that glycogen all the time as an energy source when we're not eating and its role um, in working with red blood cells is and white blood cells. So what happens if you don't have enough B6? Widespread symptoms because of its role in so many things. So anything from depression to vomiting to skin disorders, nerve problems, and impaired immunity. One of the things that B6 is really responsible for, and this relates to its role also in blood health, is that um, what happens is if there's a B6 deficiency, those red blood cells tend to be have a smaller amount of hemoglobin in them. And that's often called microcytic hypochromic anemia, which is, again, the small amounts in the cell of the iron. And w the cell can't produce enough ATP when aerobic metabolism is limited, which a lot of times we're using anaerobic without oxygen metabolism. So how much do we need? Again, these are micronutrients. We need very little. And the average intake is well over the RDA. Athletes do need more because they break down more protein and glycogen. But again, they're eating more calories, so they're going to be getting more B6. Where do we get it? Animal products, fortified cereals because they put it on, potatoes, spinach, bananas, cantaloupes. And if you look here, you can see it is in a wide variety of foods. So just to kind of review those B vitamins and where do we get them, they're really in everything. But protein is probably, protein sources are probably a higher concentration. And the way I think about this is thinking about protein in the sense that an, an animal like a cow, if you're eating meat from a cow, that cow had to eat a lot of grass to make that protein. So really what this does is it allows um, a more concentrated source. So it's in grains, fruits, veggies, dairy, but I would say that the protein foods tend to have the highest concentration of the B vitamins. Okay. Chromium. Chromium is really important because this aids in insulin um, and insulin at the cell level. So insulin uptake at the cell level and getting the glucose into the cells. So one of the problems that we've seen is people who have um, poor glucose, glucose control, i.e. diabetics, pre-diabetics, tend to have low levels of chromium. What's interesting though, we don't really know how much chromium is in our food. We haven't really been able to measure that very well. But if you look, it's in, again, the wide variety of foods and m most Americans are getting enough, okay? Um, manganese and manganese and magnesium work together in the metabolic process and also are involved in bone health, very rare deficiencies, and in a wide variety of foods. And molybdenum, human enzymes need molybdenum. The deficiency is also rare because it's in such a wide variety of foods. This is from your book, and this is a good review of what I just went through. The name of the vitamin, the major functions, dietary sources, and deficiencies. This would be a great thing to have when you're taking your, your quiz, have this open in your book, perhaps even make some note cards to really reiterate. I definitely don't make you memorize the adult RDA. What I like for people to know is, do Americans get enough? And as we discussed in most all of these B vitamins, Americans do. Iodide would be the only one, and it would really depend on what your sodium source is. All right, so let's talk a little bit about blood health. So blood has four elements to it, white cells, red cells, platelets, and plasma. Plasma being the largest component of that. So I'm not going to ask you to memorize any of this process, but I think it's interesting to think about when we talk about um, stem cells, 
the stem cells for blood cells begin in the bone marrow. And so those blood cells um, turn into different types of cells. And that's where we get the platelets and the white blood cells and the red blood cells. So what is vitamin K in all of that? Well, one thing about vitamin K is that our gut can make vitamin K, so we don't have to have it. And really, the main role of vitamin K, we learned a little bit about vitamin K in bone health, but its main role is to activate prothrombin, which makes thrombin, which makes our blood clot. Okay, so again, when you have damage to the tissue, so let's say you skin your knee, um, you're, you don't, the, the, act, the clotting factors are inactive. Calcium and vitamin K activate those, and it makes prothrombin, which goes to make thrombin, which actually starts to make the clot. And how that clot is formed is there's threads of fibrin that trap blood cells and platelets and fluid so that it kind of puts up like a little dam so that the blood stops bleeding. So what happens um, if you don't get enough? Well, first of all, it's very rare, but some infants may be deficient at birth because their gut is sterile. And in this country, infants are routinely given a shot of vitamin K at birth. What's interesting is that infants do make vitamin K in about seven to 10 days after birth once they start nursing and especially the colostrum which is the first milk from the mother is very good at producing that gut bacteria. Remember gut bacteria is good and it is interesting if, if anyone is Jewish and um, the Jewish tradition is usually not to circumcise until around 10 days after the birth which kind of coincide to when those clotting factors are more active. But in this country, all infants are given a, a routine shot of vitamin K because they tend to have circumcisions or any type of procedures done in those first hours of birth while they're still in the hospital. So how much do we need? Again, these are very small amounts. This is micrograms, very small amounts. Um, elderly adults probably have the least intake, but most of the time Americans get enough despite which always amazes me, that it really is only in dark green leafy vegetables. So it just shows you we don't need that much. Patients on Coumadin, which is a blood thinner, have to be careful about how much vitamin K they intake because it can interfere with the function of that. And if you look at those pictures, it's all dark green leafy vegetables. What happens if you get too much? It is a fat soluble vitamin, but we don't have any reports of toxicity. Okay, so um, continuing on to talk about hemoglobin, um, this is the main portion of the cell that carries oxygen. And here's a little picture of the red blood cell and the heme on those and how oxygen is carried. So anemia, the one that we typically hear about is iron deficiency anemia. There are other types of anemia, but iron deficiency anemia is when the body doesn't have enough iron to make hemoglobin to hold the oxygen. Okay, so we talked about vitamin K, its role in clotting. I'm going to talk a little bit about folate B12 and B6. We just talked about iron, and then copper and zinc. So folate is an interesting B vitamin. It is involved in coenzyme metabolism, as we learned with most B vitamins, but it also plays a major role in cell division. And this helps, obviously, form DNA. And one of the other things that folate does is it activates, it metabolizes amino acids. So for example, homocysteine is an amino acid that breaks down to methionine, and um, folate is in charge of that. When you have low levels of folate, you tend to have higher levels of homocysteine, which have been shown to be linked to heart disease. One of the problems in folate deficiency with the blood cells is because it's involvement in cellular division, the cells don't tend to divide and they become very large, okay? And when those cells become large, there's not enough DNA in the nuclei to divide. So they call it megablastic, so mega being big. The problem is, is that if you don't have enough folate, you can have these very large blood cells that don't have enough DNA, and that causes anemia as well. And this is a picture. So normally when cells go to divide, they divide equally and normally, but if you don't have folate, they tend to get very, very big, and that's called a megablastic cell. One of the problems, too, is that folate is involved in DNA synthesis, and 
there's been a strong link to women who are deficient in folate and the incidence of spina bifida, which is a spinal de defect that happens in utero. Those neural tubes close within the first 28 days, that spine is really formed. So that's like the first four weeks of pregnancy. Most women don't even know they're pregnant until about six to eight weeks. So there actually has been recommendation that all child aged, child bearing aged women take a folate supplement because most in this country, half of the pregnancies are unplanned. And this is a picture of what happens. If these don't close properly, then fluid can link in here and these kids become paralyzed. The March of Dimes has declared this the most preventable birth defect. So how much do we need? About 400 micrograms, small amounts, in pregnancy a little higher. And the problem is, is that folate is very susceptible to heat. So when you cook foods that have a lot of folate in them, you're losing like half the folate. So where do we get it? Green leafy vegetables, better, higher folate levels if eaten raw, orange juice, dried beans, fortified cereals, fortified bread, milk. Folate also stands for foliage, so that's why the dark green leafy vegetables are so high. Okay, so when we look at where do we get folate, you see those vegetables tend to be the highest. What happens if we get too much? One of the problems is, is that um, it can mask a B12 deficiency. So let's talk about B12, okay, also called cobolamin. And what that does is it helps folate metabolize. And it's also responsible in maintaining the myelin sheets that inner insulates the neurons. And it's, it's um, B12 requires something in the gut called the intrinsic factor to break the B12 down in our food to a, a way that we can absorb it. So most of the time, people who are deficient are deficient because they don't have enough intrinsic factor, like the elderly. So that's why sometimes you'll hear of people getting B12 shots instead of taking a B12 supplement because putting that in your GI tract is not gonna help that absorption. Where do we get it? It's only found in animal foods, but in this country, most soy products are fortified with it. And there's all the animal products. And again, these cereals are fortified with it. All right, so we talked a little bit about iron, but iron is very important for brain and immune function. It's a part of hemoglobin and myoglobin, and it also helps detoxify drugs in the liver. So what happens if you don't get enough? Typically what happens is iron deficiency anemia, and that is actually the most common disease worldwide. Some symptoms of that are fatigue, pale skin, being cold, loss of appetite. Women and children tend to be most susceptible because they have higher needs. Women because they menstruate and lose iron every month and children because they're in such a rapid stage of growth. So that's why males and postmenopausal women have a lower need than females and children. Where do we get it? Well, there's two sources. There's heme, which we get from animal products and non-heme, which we get from plant products. And the supplements are in the non-heme form. One of the ways to increase the absorption of the non-heme, because this is much more easily absorbed because it's more like the form found in our body, is to in, um, eat vitamin C with a non-heme source. So for example, adding marinara sauce to your spaghetti noodles will increase the absorption of those. Okay, then there are several things that can inhibit the non-heme from being um, absorbed. Things like tannins, which are found in tea, oxalates, which are found in dark green leafy vegetable, phytates, which are found in fiber, and megadoses of other minerals. Where do we get iron? Mostly in protein foods, but the non-heme sources are found in plant foods. Excess can be a problem. It can cause stomach irritation. This typically occurs when people are taking supplements. And the excess can be very dangerous to children. Copper is also a component in our blood system and involved in blood clotting and the immune system. Where do we get it? Liver, legumes, seeds, whole grains, bread, cereals, cocoa. That's always good to know when you're drinking 
um, hot cocoa or eating chocolate, you can be getting some copper. 